Okay, today I'm going to talk about John Locke. Uh, Locke's uh, view, uh, we're in the chapter on, on uh, knowledge, epistemology. So last time I talked about Descartes. And Descartes, uh, one of his great concerns was skepticism. You know, he's looking for certainty. And he found it in the cogito, the I think. Uh, Descartes is a rationalist. He was trying to build knowledge on a, a certain foundation which he found in the bare positing of the I think, the cogito. And on that basis, he attempted to erect uh, science. John Locke is a empiricist. Uh, and in contrast to Descartes, who is a rationalist, Descartes believes that all knowledge is based in experience. They do agree about certain things, though, so let me make it very clear what Descartes and Locke agree about when it comes... They do agree, agree about perception. So, for example, uh, this is an apple. Locke and Descartes agree about their view of perception, which is called the representative theory of perception. Which is that for Locke and, Bar and and Descartes, when I when I this apple, I don't see an apple. What I see are ideas, and these are ideas that are in my mind. Uh, so this is a very this is a very modern idea. Aristotle and Plato believed that you see apples, and most people do. They they believe when you look at an apple, you see an apple. You look at a tree, you see a tree. But the uh, Descartes and Locke and just about all the great philosophers that follow them, and in fact, even today, scientists today who study perception would agree with Locke and Descartes that what we perceive are not objects in the world. We perceive what we perceive are ideas or perceptions that are in our mind. Uh, and whether they and then the question as to what is actually in the world, that's a different question. We never perceive the object. So that's important. Um, so here's Locke's view of perception. What happens is now he he didn't have he 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 talked about corpuscles in his day. They the, the, these tiny particles that would come from the apple and impinge on a retina. Today they refer to them as you know we talk about light waves and photons and so on that in, impact upon a retina, set up a set of uh, electrochemical impulses, and ult ultimately there's we have a perception someplace in our brain. Locke would uh, argue that this apple, Locke believes that our idea of an apple is actually a composition, a compound of many simple ideas. The simple ideas would be, for example, the shape, the shape of the apple. So these are the primary qualities. Well, the simple ideas would be the shape, the color, the feel of it, if I bite into it, the taste. Uh, the weight of it, if I hold it, it has a certain weight. These are all simple ideas, I, I, meaning I can't break them up and I can't decompose them into simpler components. And then from these simple ideas, we put them together and I formed the idea of the apple. The apple is a complex idea. And when I talk about this apple here, it's an apple that is, has a certain shape, has a certain color, it's red, has a certain feel to it, a certain taste. So for, for Locke, a, the uh, the apple the my concept of the the apple is a complex idea composed of many simple ideas. Now these simple ideas, Locke says, uh, that we form together to form the idea of a, of an apple, cannot just be floating in empty space, right? I mean the red has to be the red of something. That the 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 color has to be the color of something. Everything. There's something here which it has a certain shape, has a certain feel, has a certain taste. What is that something that has the certain shape, that has a certain color? That something is what Locke calls a substance. Now, what is this substance? What is it? What is this apple is a substance, and what is it? 
It has a certain shape. It has a certain color. It's what underlies. Sub means under substance. Uh, it what what underlies or stands under all these ideas that they attach to. That what is it that this shape attaches to? What is it that the color attaches to? That Locke says is the substance. What is it? And his answer to that is I know not. Is something I know not what. So Locke's answer to the question, what is this apple? His answer is, I don't know what it is. His answer to, what is this pen? His answer is, I don't know what it is. What is this orange? I don't know, he would say. What is this pencil? And so on. He doesn't know what substance is. It's something I know not what. Now, that's not Descartes' answer. Descartes thought he knew what this apple was. It's extended. It's ex it's a piece of matter, and the essence of matter is to be extended in space. So that's one difference between Locke and Descartes. Descartes thought he knew what substance was. It was ex a material substance. Was it was something extended in space? Extension is the very essence of a, of, a, of a material body. Locke would say he doesn't know what it is because the if something is extended, something has to be extended. What is that something that is extended? And Locke says, we don't know. It's something I know not what. All we know is how it appears to us. So Locke believes that simple ideas, we have uh, uh, this apple, for example, is composed of, of, of a it's a collection of many simple ideas. Together they form the, con the complex idea of the apple. Now for Locke, simple ideas resemble Simple ideas resemble the primary qualities. So Locke distinguishes between primary qualities, primary qualities, and primary qualities are really in the apple. So the primary qualities would be like the shape, the weight, right? These are This apple really does have a certain shape. It does have a certain weight. The motion, it's either moving or it's at rest. So this apple has a certain shape, a certain weight, uh, and whatever other mechanical properties it has. Um, the main ones are shape, weight, whether it's moving or at rest. These are actually in the apple. So my idea, when I look at this apple, I have, a, I could, I have an idea of the shape. I look at the shape, that's a simple idea. And the simple idea actually resembles the shape. So it resemblance, so resembles. The simple idea of secondary qualities, secondary qualities would be like the color, color and the taste, for example. The color, this apple, a lot of, if you said to some, uh, a person, we, you know, somebody, tell me something about this apple. And they would say, well, it's red. Descartes would say, I mean, Locke would say, no, it isn't red. You're, you're mistaken. This apple is not red. The apple does have the, the shape it has. It has the, 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 the weight it has, the volume it has. It's either at rest or moving. It has all that stuff. These are really a characteristic of the apple, but the shape, the, but the color and the taste um, and the feel of it, these are not in the apple, they're in our mind. So our simple idea of secondary quality, qualities does not resemble uh, the, what's in the apple, the color in the, what we call, it does not resemble anything in the apple. So simple ideas can resemble or not resemble. My idea or my uh, uh, or perception of red is that does not resemble anything in the apple. The red is in my mind. My idea of the shape does resemble the shape of the apple. So that's a very important for Locke. Now, what about skepticism? You know, remember Descartes said that uh, he can doubt everything. And the only thing, he could doubt that there's an apple here because he might be dreaming. Remember that in the first meditation. Locke, what does Locke say about, about uh, Locke, Locke disagrees with Descartes on that. 
for Locke, perception is yields knowledge. It does. You cannot be skeptical. Locke doesn't believe anyone can be seriously, sincerely skeptical about what they perceive. Uh, and he says, for example, if you're skeptical, if you look at a fire and you say, well, I don't really know if there's a fire there because uh, I could be dreaming. Locke said, you know, you know uh, how, to, how to test that? Put your hand in it. And you'll find out very quickly that there really is a fire. You know how you're going to find out? Because you're going you're to feel pain and you're going to take your hand back. And Locke says, we don't need any more certainty than the, than the testimony of our senses. If you doubt that there's a lion there, just put your hand out and see if the lion bites you and you'll take your hand back. That will leave no doubt in your mind whatsoever that there is something out there. Now, what exactly what that thing out there is, Locke says, it's something I know not what, but he says there can be no doubt whatsoever that there is something out there. And he says, if you think everything, another thing he says to Descartes, if you're so skeptical as to believe that everything outside of you may be a dream, then I really have, we have, there's no controversy between us because then, because then you, because then you were, you are dreaming that I'm even speaking to you. And, but he says that if you want to, pre, if you want to dream my answer, here's my answer and you could pretend that you could dream, pretend I'm dreaming, you're dreaming in my answer. But, and then he goes on to say that, that we need no more certainty than the testimony of our own actions, because what ultimately concerns us is pleasure and pain. Uh, and when you put your uh, hand in fire, you, believe me, you will feel pain and you will withdraw it. So Locke says, perception yields knowledge. Uh, you, there are certain things you cannot doubt, since, seriously, uh, sincerely doubt. You can, you can say it as a, as a game. Uh, you can pretend you're doubting, but in, in reality, you can't. If you're walking across the seat and you see, you see a, giant, a, a gigantic truck, you know, hauling at you at 40 miles, 60 miles an hour, believe me, you're going to get out of the road. You're going to get out of the road. You're going to get out of the way of the truck. You're going to have, you're not going to be a skeptic at that point. And Locke says, we need no more certainty uh, than the, the certainty of our, of our actions. So Locke um, uh, ultimately is, he's an empiricist. Uh, but he, the empiricists and the uh, and the and the rationalists, uh, it's very important that they do. They agree on perception. They agree that we don't perceive the world; we perceive representations of the world. Um, and that's going to be uh, that that whole idea of a subject over against an object. That we are subjects in a world of which we really don't have knowledge of uh, we we know there's something for luck we know there's something out there but we really don't know it so when it comes to epistemology as an empiricist Locke believes there are limits to what we can know and one actually one of great, Locke's great contributions to epistemology is his he set up his program was to determine what are the limits of knowledge uh, a very famous uh, passage in Locke where, is where he's sitting down with his friends and they're discussing metaphysical issues, you know, the, the metaphysics of, De, of Descartes, uh, people like Spinoza, uh, they, who created these metaphysical systems, and, and they all disagree, all these metaphysical systems disagree, and so Locke and his friends are discussing them. And uh, Locke, you know, at some point he said, he just stopped and said, you know, what we really need to do is stop discussing these metaphysical issues because we there's no way to res we're not finding any way to resolve them, and so what we should really do is determine what are the limits, what are the limits of knowledge, and what can we know, and what what are the limits, uh, what what really is lies within the within the competence of the human mind. Locke was the first person to set that agenda. Uh, for philosophy. He was the first person. And since Locke, it has been carried out. Main, pro, the, probably the best the no, person most notable for carrying out that project was Immanuel Kant. Uh, and when, when we get to Kant, we'll, we'll talk about that. But for Locke, anyway, at this point, I, uh, uh, and, and next I'm going to go on to Berkeley. Uh, next uh, lecture, I'll talk about Berkeley. But Berkeley, uh, the th last thing I want to say about Locke is that knowledge yields that perception for Locke, unlike for Descartes, does actually yield knowledge. It doesn't yield knowledge of the essence of things. Like, for example, Locke does not know the essence of the sample, but he does believe that our, not, our, that our perception makes it beyond doubt 
that there is something here. What it is, he says, is something I know not what. But there is something there. The primary qualities actually are there. The next time I'm going to talk about Barclay, and Barclay says luck is inconsistent. So I'll talk about that next time.